Let's talk about opportunity recognition and financial feasibility. I want to preface this by saying I am not a management professor. I am not a marketing expert. That's not the viewpoint we're taking. We're coming at this from an engineering perspective, and I know not all of you are engineers, but it's okay. It's good to learn different perspectives on the same system. From an engineering perspective, uh, engineers can come up with new opportunities for their businesses to follow and do all the time. And while the ultimate marketing and business of this may be handled by other people within the company, it is the engineer's responsibility to have at least a basic idea that what they are saying can be profitable and does have a market. So we're going to spend just a little time talking about how we determine at uh, the simplest level how uh, much, if there is, profit potential for a product that we are considering. Um, I would like also to build on this. Uh, not in this class, but I want to point out to you, we're going to do a simplified version that is just looking at this instant in time, but to do a, a minimal engineering, more rigorous version of this, we should also incorporate the time value of money because any investment in infrastructure, such as the uh, ice cream pop popsicle freezing machine, um, is going to have to be paid off generally over time. And so that means we have to account for how time operates in all of this. But we're going to do just the first order version where we look at essentially a mass balance, a material balance on money. What's going out, what's coming in, and how can we get an uh, initial idea if we have profit potential in what we're doing. So let's talk a little bit about opportunity recognition. And I think there's a few elements here, in, and there are entire classes on this, and if you're into this, I uh, really uh, encourage you to spend more time on it. But what most of them boil down to is paying attention, paying attention to a field that you're familiar with, a field that you know, uh, and looking for places where there are unmet needs. And what do we mean by unmet needs? Something that would make people's lives better, more enjoyable, uh, a service that they require, a product that would be better. Um, and people don't always know what their unmet needs are until someone comes in and does a little background research. So it, while it is often helpful to have fresh eyes on a problem, having fresh eyes that don't have any technical understanding is less helpful. So when you have an idea, it's good to do uh, a bit of background research on it and also bring your personal expertise to it and to connect it to things you understand. There's a very long list of problems that have been solved uh, with new innovations when someone with a deep expertise in one field walks into another field and says, aha, maybe we can solve this in a similar way to how we solved this other problem that I was involved in in the past. So for example, this hasn't been a bust out problem yet, but you can imagine maybe some of you have seen uh, a thing like the Roomba, which is a, the little vacuum cleaner that vacuums on its own robotically. And uh, that that technology has been adapted to work as a lawnmower. And there's a potentially unmet need, uh, finding another way for people to get grass cut. And it is leveraging, it is reusing, something that worked fine in one setting to find a, a place for it in the other. So let's think a little bit uh, about popsicles as an example. So if you're working on frozen treats as your problem, maybe a good place to start is to wander around the grocery store, or if uh, you don't want to do that physically, wander around the internet version of a grocery store. And what are some things you might pay attention to here as you are looking for opportunities? Well, one thing that strikes me is perhaps paying some attention to the varying prices we see here might be illuminating. Also, uh, looking at who are these for? And some of that maybe you can infer by looking at the packaging. Some of that you can infer by looking at the advertising. Um, and there are uh, many sources online uh, some of which are behind paywalls, some of which we have access to through the school library that will tell you about market size for 
various types of food. Uh, so for example, uh, if you are logged in through the Bucknell Library, you have access to a large research database that has uh, graphical information um, that will tell you, uh, for example, what are the best-selling candies in the United States over the past 10 years. I'll, I'll supply a link for that on the website. So looking here, uh, we get an idea of what an appropriate sales price might be. Um, and we also get an idea of common form factors, common flavors, and we can think about what are some uh, really high potential uh, areas that are not being addressed here. All right, so I'm not gonna necessarily give you one of these that you all should go for, but I think it's pretty clear that at least the subset that we're looking at here are really pretty strongly aimed at kids, right? Like we have you know, the frozen folks sitting on that, and we have bright colors, and we have very sweet and fruity flavors. And maybe there is another market for these that is not being tapped right here. And once you have that idea, then you're back to estimating, well, how many of these am I going to sell? And that, uh, in part, I encourage you to take on like a Fermi problem. Uh, an example of a Fermi problem is shown in the video on systems, so go watch that one. Uh, and then you're going to plug that into what I'm about to show you about potential profitability. So for those of you who aren't chemical engineers, here is the grand secret of all chemical engineering. If you say, oh, let's do a material balance on that, and remind everyone that it's equal to in minus out plus accumulation, then uh, you've just convinced 85% of people that you have a degree in chemical engineering. Let's map this over to how it might be considered as money. So if we have a business where we're making frozen treats, uh, for us, in is going to be sales, right? That's going to be money coming in to our system, which is our business. And out is going to be all of the things we have to spend money on. So this is going to be raw materials. And it's going to be, and I'm going to put a little bracket around this so I can put a negative sign outside the whole thing. So we have uh, raw materials. We got to pay the workers. We got to get equipment. We have to get utilities. We got to pay taxes and insurance. Uh, and am I missing anything else big? I probably am. I'm going to just put ETC for whatever it is I have left off at the moment. And in our, I'm going to note in our little initial consideration here, we're going to pay attention to sales, raw materials, and we will acknowledge that there are uh, workers, equipment, and utilities, uh, but we're not going to. We're not going to work those in quite yet. And then what is accumulation in this case? Well, in this case, it's profit, right? Uh, it's what's left. Uh, if out turns out to be a bigger number than in, uh, the uh, negative version of that, because you can have negative accumulation, that's loss. Alrighty. So uh, let's think about how uh, how best to break this down. So sales comes from selling your popsicles, your ice pops. And raw materials is going to be proportional, right? So you buy as much raw material as you, uh, as you expect to sell ice pops. So these two here, so ingredients, are tightly linked, right? So if you want to make uh, more ice pops, you have to buy more raw materials. They move together all the time. Whereas uh, the equipment is a cost that is uh, within certain limits, it's the same no matter what, right? So you buy a machine, the freezing machine that's capable of doing 20 uh, ice pops at a time, and you use it to make one ice pop, or you use it to make 20 ice pops, 
the machine was the same machine and it still cost the $10,000 it cost, right? Does that, does that make sense? So that means, um, and then likewise with the workers, um, your, your facility is running for some amount of time and uh, unless you have a, a very, a, a more unusual scheme, unless you're paying people by the piece, your workers are working say eight hours pretty much no matter what and therefore you have uh, what what they get paid is the same if they make one ice pop or if they make 20 or they make 20,000. <clears> Again, also uh, probably more like that for the utilities as well. So it's the fact that we have these two different kinds of uh, costs. We have some that vary with how much we make, and then we have some that are pretty much the same no matter how much we make. And it is the fact that we have the two of these that means that when we put it together, so let's make a graph of what happens here. And the y-axis is going to be money, and the x-axis is going to be number of ice pops we make. And we're going to graph on here sales, we're going to graph on here raw materials, and we're going to graph on here kind of our fixed costs, which are the workers, equipment, and utilities. And then we're going to graph what happens when we put those all together. All right, so first let's fill in this green line, which is our sales. And that looks great, except I got to put in here, down here, is our fixed expenses, those expenses like the workers and the equipment and the utilities that stay kind of the same no matter what. And then also, I'm going to put in our raw materials cost. I'm also going to do that in red. Now you'll notice that it's really important that you look at this and you see these two lines are on uh, different slopes, that the materials slope is shallower than the sales slope. And uh, that's what we're going to need if this thing is ever going to turn a profit. If it costs more to buy the raw materials than to uh, sell the popsicles, then we're, we are out of luck. We are not ever going to make this work, no matter what we do with the fixed costs. Um, you'll notice there's actually a lot of businesses that start out this way. And uh, you will have to go, oh yes, star of simplification. So we're ignoring the time value of money. I am ignoring potential investment. I'm just giving you uh, the basic idea to consider, right? Lots of stars of simplification. Please come back, uh, those of you who are management majors, after you've had a chance to take the relevant classes and give us the more detailed version of this. All right, so what happens? So uh, now we want to look at what our profit or loss potential is. And I'm going to do that in blue. And that comes from adding the value of the green line to the value of the materials line to the value of the fixed line. We're going to add all of those together. So it's you add that in your brain. It starts out way down here. Okay, so we've spent a lot of money and made no money. Uh, and then it should go kind of up pretty slowly and eventually curve uh, upwards. And it's never going to get a higher slope than this. So this, I, I shouldn't ever draw that as a higher slope. Uh, but eventually, when you make a bazillion, a bazillion pops, the uh, impact of the fixed cost gets pretty much offset by how much more sales you have coming in and you might be able to turn a profit. So this magic point right there, look, you broke even. That's the break even point. And ideally, this break even point is at a much lower point of pops than your potential market. 
which you uh, estimated by doing a Fermi problem before. So you're not gonna be able to do this with full detail, right? Uh, you'd have to do that if this were a business plan and you were actually gonna start the uh, ice pot making business, but you should at least uh, be able to come up with an idea that your sales price is going to be able to be bigger than your raw materials and possibly buy enough bigger that you could imagine you could pay at least one person, say yourself, uh, some kind of wage for this and also eventually pay off whatever additional equipment you think you need. But also see the video about process scale up. You can do quite a lot with just conventional equipment before you go to the making uh, 10,000 ice pops an hour machine. You can probably sustain a regional business just based on having a whole bunch of freezers available.